Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks so much for taking time to join us this afternoon. My name is Stacy Fox, and I use she, her pronouns, and I'm really proud to be the president and CEO at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. And welcome to our budget primer town hall. Um, our brilliant team has analyzed the state budget to provide thoughtful analysis and responsible solutions for all Georgians. At GBPI, we believe our statewide systems and investments should be what makes us healthy, what protects us, not the other way around. This year marks GBPI's 20th anniversary, a milestone we are deeply proud of. To honor this momentous occasion, we're thrilled to unveil a special edition of our annual publication, a testament to two, get two decades of dedication, growth, and impact. This edition is not just a compilation of numbers. It is a celebration of our journey and the milestones we've reached together. We are eager to share this special edition with you today and acknowledging that our journey to this point would not have been possible without each of you. And if you know me, you, know, you then know that my mantra is that we're all in this together, this democracy experiment, we're doing it together. This event, this Primer Town Hall, is a unique opportunity for us at GBPI to share our findings and for you to engage directly with GBPI's research team, whom I often refer to as our brain trust. These subject matter experts have invested numerous hours compiling this publication, and we look forward to the insightful discussions that will result from today's presentation. If you ordered a printed copy of the primer, it should hit your mailbox very soon. In the meantime, you can access a full copy of our report online at gbpi.org backslash primer. And we'll drop the link in the chat for you now. I'm immensely grateful to the team for their hard work and I'm excited for everyone to gain valuable insights as to what's in store for Georgia this fiscal year. As you all, no, the budget is always a mixed bag of progress and regress. And for the fourth consecutive year, the revenue shortfall reserve is maxed out at $5.4 billion, while undesignated reserves are projected to reach $11.6 billion during Georgia's 2025 fiscal year. These funds come directly from Georgians' pockets from each of you, and they should be used to make key improvements in areas that demand immediate attention, like investing in the state's struggling healthcare infrastructure or establishing a child care trust fund. Those are some of the ideas put forth by our team here at GBPI. You'll see throughout this presentation that we'll drop links to work we have done on various issues, and the surplus is one of them. You'll see a link to that shortly. You know, Georgia is also continuing to prioritize corporations over people, delivering outsized tax credits, deductions, and tax breaks to select groups and industries, such as the film industry, with little benefit for Georgians and insufficient transparency and safeguards in place to monitor these expenditures. Without meaningful reforms, the state risks continuing a pattern of fiscal policies that may favor the interests of a few at the expense of the many, potentially overlooking more equitable and sustainable investments that could benefit a larger portion of our state's population. Our hope is that our budget primer will help you understand your budget for our partners, our advocates, and state leaders to better understand the details of what's included in the governor's budget and that you'll use all our analyses to influence legislation, to influence legislation, I'm sorry about that, and policy outcomes in favor of those who are always first impacted by change. People of color in our state, those experiencing poverty in Georgia or justice impacted Georgians. Not just the most wealthy and powerful of our state should benefit from our tax system. This is sort of this is the sort of evidence-based activism that will help to advance our vision of a fair and inclusive Georgia where everyone can prosper. We want data to be a tool, not a weapon. And you can count on us at GBPI every day to continue to liberate, to continue to liberate data, information, and stories for the benefit of us all. With that said, I'd like to introduce you to one of our team members, our moderator for today, Erin Robinson. Erin serves as GBPI's Director of Outreach and Strategic Campaigns, 
working closely with partners, coalitions, and individual Georgians to achieve policy wins. Erin will introduce each of our speakers and cover any housekeeping items ahead of our presentation. In the meantime, I would be remiss to not ask you to please consider donating to Georgia Budget and Policy Institute today. GBPI is a nonpartisan research and policy institute that relies on the support of our community to fund the work we do. Work that frankly no one else in this state is doing. The research we produce is used to hold our state government accountable with the goal of informing fiscal policy and public programs that support Georgians in every corner of our state. Your gift will help us to continue to be an influential voice on budget and policy in Georgia and allow us to deliver valuable research and insights, just like the content we're about to cover today. We've dropped the link in the donate. We've dropped the link to donate in the chat. You'll see lots of resources from us in the chat today, or you can go to our website, gbpi.org, where there is lots of information and resources, including a button to donate. Thanks again for taking the time to, do to join us this afternoon. And Erin, I am now going to pass the mic to you. Thanks, Stacy. Good afternoon, everyone. Really happy to be here with you. As Stacy said, I am Erin Robinson, Director of Outreach and Strategic Campaigns here at GBPI, and I'll be your moderator today. So you'll be hearing presentations from GBPI's analysts who have produced the data and research for our budget primer publication. There will be space at the end of the presentation for you to ask questions directly to our analysts about the information covered during this event. So if you have questions at any point, please feel free to utilize the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And let me also note, if you're having technical difficulties or if it seems like you can't hear us and it looks like something that might be a widespread issue, um, please feel free to put that in the Q&A box as well, just to make sure we know and we can get that fixed as quickly as possible. And in case we don't answer all questions today, we will make sure to follow up with an email to attendees. So I'll take a moment to introduce our speakers. So first we'll have Danny Canzo, Director of Legislative Strategy and Senior Fiscal Analyst, and he'll be covering budget and revenue. Then we'll hear from Ife Finch Floyd, our Director of Economic Justice, who will be discussing DECAL and later in the presenta presentation, Human Services. Ife will be followed by Ashley Young, our uh, senior education analyst, discussing K-12 education and higher education, followed by Leah Chan, our director of health justice, and then by our health policy fellow, Hilary Dong, to discuss housing. And lastly, but certainly not least, Ray Kalfani, our senior analyst for worker justice and criminal legal systems, who will cover the Department of Labor and the Department of Corrections. So now that you've met our analysts, we'll get our presentation started. So Danny, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Erin, and good afternoon, and thank you to all of those joining us today. Uh, before we dive into the primer, I, I do just want to highlight that Georgia's budget uh, is the core policy roadmap that our state follows. It is the only piece of legislation that our lawmakers are constitutionally obligated to pass every year. Uh, and, and it does really important things uh, across all of these policy areas that you'll hear about today, from providing health care for over 2 million Georgians to funding the 2,300 public schools across our state that educate 1.7 million students every day, to the 449,000 students enrolled in our technical colleges and our university system and beyond. Uh, and, and I'll start with a little bit of an anecdote as, as GBPI reaches 20 years uh, that I think sums up some of the positive progress that we've seen uh, and also uh, lays out why we have more to do. If we look at spending per person in Georgia uh, and break that down across our 11 million residents, this year uh, we are going to spend about $3,223 per person. When we adjust that for inflation and we look back 20 years to FY 2006, uh, that number was $3,080 per person. So if we look at the 20-year rate of growth, it's about 0.2% per year that we've adjusted that budget level. And even though we've seen a number of wins in those years, we've made progress, we still have a long way to go. And there are a lot of areas that have stagnated in that period because of cuts that were made in the Great Recession, funding that was removed during the pandemic, 
Uh, and as we'll talk about, uh, a whole host of funds that right now are sitting in state reserve accounts uh, and not going to work for Georgians. Um, so the first aspect of our budget uh, that's that's fundamentally important uh, is, is where we raise our money. Um, and, and what you'll see here is the governor's revenue estimate for FY 2025. Uh, and I think it's important to make that distinction uh, because in our budget system in Georgia, under the law, the governor has the sole authority to set the revenue estimate with the advice of the state economist. And so these numbers are the numbers that the governor has set forward that lawmakers then have to follow, uh, which essentially act as a cap for the amount that they can appropriate. Um, and so that's part of the reasons we'll talk about uh, through re low revenue estimates that we've seen uh, these compounding, really extraordinarily large surpluses over the last few years um, and, and why we might have hope uh, of, of a different direction in the future. So the cornerstone of our revenue system is the income tax. You can see between personal income taxes and corporate income taxes, it's a majority of the funds that our state spends every year. Uh, next, you'll see sales taxes, uh, a little less than a quarter of the state budget. Uh, this is an area where Georgia has lagged nationally. Although in recent years, we've made some progress taxing uh, digital downloads uh, and the e-sales tax, we're one of very few states that don't tax services uh, really in any respect. Um, and, and so that means that as the economy has changed over the last 40 years, become more service intensive, less goods intensive, we've seen that sales tax share dip as a percentage of the budget. And we really are very reliant on that income tax. That's why it's important that we keep it whole and strong going forward. Uh, and then you can see about 10% of the state budget is made of designated funds. Those are areas that under the constitution have to serve a single purpose. So the lottery funds, uh, pre-K uh, and higher education, uh, motor fuel taxes fund infrastructure. Uh, we have tobacco settlement funds that largely fund healthcare um, and, and so on. Um, so if we move to the next slide, we can see how those taxes are distributed across Georgians. Uh, this is an area where there's a common misconception, uh, but in reality, the lowest income Georgians pay the highest share of their incomes in state and local taxes. Uh, and we, when we break that out into the cross tabs and look at race and ethnicity, what we find are that Black and Hispanic Georgians are overrepresented among the lowest income Georgians, and that they actually pay uh, among the highest share of their incomes in these state and local taxes. And so when we dig a little bit deeper, uh, what we find is that the sales tax is one of the biggest culprits. Uh, that is a regressive tax where folks who have the lowest incomes are going to pay the highest share uh, relative to their earning capacity because they, they depend on you know, the, the goods and the services and the things that they use every day. Um, and then you can see those at the top of the economic ladder pay uh, relatively about 25% less than those uh, in the lowest 20%. So each of the 20 percentiles are about a million households. You can see the top share are paying about 7.5% of their income in uh, state and local taxes each year. Um, now, if we continue on, um, we can talk a bit about the uh, overview of the spending side. So when we add in federal funds, uh, the state budget grows from $36.1 billion uh, to about $66.8 billion. Uh, those federal funds are, are primarily coming uh, to help fund Medicaid. The state gets about $10.9 billion from the federal government uh, for that function, uh, a little less than $3 billion for K through 12 education, about $2 billion for higher education, uh, followed by uh, a little over $1.5 billion for infrastructure, uh, and then $1.2 billion for human services. Um, so we can break that out a bit if we continue to the next slide and look at uh, state spending. So again, the, the vast majority of the things that our state government does would really fall into the category of essential services. Uh, so that is led by education and healthcare. We look at that entire budget, uh, about three quarters of every dollar that the state spends goes to those core functions. Uh, and what we see is about 38 cents of every dollar goes to K through 12 education. Uh, that's followed by health as the next largest area of spending. Uh, about a fifth of the entire state budget 
goes to uh, the various health agencies and programs. About 14% goes to our technical colleges uh, and our uh, university system. Uh, that's followed by a, a tie between infrastructure and uh, corrections and the criminal legal system. Each of those areas take up about 9% of the state budget. Uh, and then you see a big drop after that. Uh, about 3% of our state budget goes to debt services. Uh, that's when we bond to pay for long-term capital projects. I'll just note here that we are at a uh, modern historic low in the amount that we are bonding annually. Uh, that means that we are investing less relative to our capacity in those long-term projects. And instead of spreading out those costs over a longer period, taking fuller advantage of our AAA bond rating, uh, we are choosing to pay for an increasing share of those large infrastructure projects with cash. Uh, and that means less money for recurring programs, more money for one-time expenditures. Um, so if we continue on, we can see the other side of the budget. Again, $19 billion in federal funds that comes down to the state. A lot of that uh, is in the form of matching funds. Uh, our Medicaid program, uh, you can see, is the largest beneficiary of that. Um, again, uh, about $11 billion each year going to Medicaid. Uh, that is uh, lower than many of our neighboring states, lower than states across the country who have chosen to fully expand Medicaid. Uh, that could unlock over $3 billion a year in additional funding uh, if we move forward with that policy decision. Uh, you can see the state remains the largest funder of K through 12 education. Uh, the federal government pitches in about $2.8 billion for that, about $2.1 billion for higher education, uh, and then again, uh, helps to fund infrastructure and human services as well. Um, so we can continue forward and look at some of those major budget trends. Now, I'm sure folks have heard a lot about the surplus. Uh, it has been a leading story now for four years, uh, going back to the end of 2021. That's the first year that we filled up our revenue shortfall reserve. So going back to the 1970s, the state created this account to make sure that when we hit hard times, when we go into recessionary events, that we don't have to make sharp spending cuts or tax increases. And instead, we can go to that savings account and we can use those funds to help get us through uh, those economic downturns. Under state law, that revenue shortfall reserve is capped at 15%. So once we go over that amount, the funds go into this other account that you'll see uh, as the, the kind of increasing line that's grown the most in this trend line, uh, and that's the unobligated surplus reserve. Um, and so that's an account that didn't exist prior to 2021. We've never had this problem before. But again, because the governor maintains sole control over the revenue estimate, and the governor has chosen to issue a series of very conservative revenue estimates, uh, that means that, that, that we have raised more money than we've spent, and we put those funds at the end of each year into uh, this unobligated surplus account that's grown from zero uh, in 2020 all the way up to now, we estimate about $11.6 billion. Um, and so just to talk about last year, uh, as an illustration of this, so for the first time, the governor in the amended 2024 budget said, we're going to make up to $2 billion available uh, from undesignated reserves uh, for the budget. Um, but what ended up happening is that the state raised about $3 billion or closer to $2.6 billion more than the governor estimated in tax collections alone. So what that added up to is that we didn't use that $2 billion that was made available for the amended budget last year, uh, the year that ended June 30th. And instead, we're actually going to add about $600 million to the unobligated reserve uh, so that that account is going to now uh, approach uh, over $11 billion. Uh, and in total, when we add in the revenue shortfall reserve, we're looking at about $16.9 billion in cash on hand. So a record amount, uh, and again, completely unprecedented as we look at the larger arc of history in this state. So if, if we look at the next slide, you can see that the revenue shortfall reserve, when, when we went into the Great Recession, we made a lot of use of that account. It helped to stabilize us. We, we drew it down uh, to, to close to zero. Um, and then we spent the next decade steadily building it up. Uh, ending each year with generally a, a few hundred million dollars in, in, in reserves. Um, and that is uh, what helped build that account back up. 
But since 2021, the account has basically been static because it's been at its maximum level of 15%. And instead, we have accumulated those increasing undesignated reserves uh, that aren't even recognized under state law. Um, you know, so so that is why uh, it, it presents kind of a, a good problem in a way, an opportunity, uh, but we have not yet taken advantage of that. So if we continue on, we can see a little bit more about what we are doing with some of those resources. Um, so the state has chosen to implement what is really a fairly regressive type of tax cut uh, by cutting down uh, what is now a flat income tax rate that all Georgians pay. Um, and so this year, the state action was to move from what was a 5.49% flat tax in January to a 5.39% flat tax uh, effective also in January. And at the same time, we matched the, the income tax rate that households, uh, individuals pay to the same rate that corporations are paying. That was a cut down from 5.75%. So for your middle income household, if you look at uh, that, that third category, the Georgians who are in the middle, they are going to save an average of about $34 over the full year because of that tax cut. Uh, and it's going to cost us statewide closer to $350 million uh, when all is said and done. You can see who the biggest beneficiary is, which is the case when we cut the income tax rate from the top down, uh, the highest income group. Far and away, you see, uh, even though it's it's a little bit of a drop in the bucket for those folks as well, because they're earning uh, so much more, um, you, you can see still the benefits are, are really outsized and tilted towards the top of the earning ladder. Uh, so if we continue on, um, finally, um, you'll see, as Stacy mentioned, um, again, we've really prioritized special inter interest tax breaks, uh, tax breaks for corporations over some common sense solutions like a child tax credit or an earned income tax credit or the type of successful programs that we see at both the federal level and in a majority of states across the country. Um, so our largest special interest tax break is the film tax credit. Uh, it consumes over a billion dollars each year in state revenue. Um, and this is an area really of diminishing return. Um, right now, our film tax credit is uncapped, and we also give out tax credits for companies that hire out-of-state workers. Uh, so even though you can get the same tax credit for an in-state worker, there is no discernible difference in the financial incentive if you hire somebody out-of-state. Um, and, and that is a real problem. We saw some traction in the last legislative session. We saw a number of legislative leaders come out for a proposal to cap the film tax credit, to make some other modifications. Unfortunately, that didn't make it over the finish line uh, and, and, and that didn't get passed and onto the governor's desk. So we still have this uncapped tax credit uh, where really every extra dollar that we're spending now that we have an, uh, an established film industry and if we looked at you know a, a more tailored program that was actually responding to in-state activity, uh, we are giving out way more than we need to. Uh, and many of uh, those dollars are going to corporations that are largely focused on hiring folks out of state and, and who are literally sending those tax dollars to companies who are, who are located out of Georgia, based out of Georgia. So we can, we can do better. We can reform that. If you look down the list, you'll see a number of other special interest tax breaks, uh, such as for insurance companies, um, global intangible income that was a match to a federal credit. Um, and, and, and these are, um, unfortunately, uh, many longstanding tax credits. If you look at those among the largest tax credits, uh, they, they usually don't have a sunset. Um, and so even though we've seen some traction for more evaluations, a little bit uh, of, of some, some improvements in recent years, uh, we can still do more to make sure that we're getting the best return on our investment. Um, and so with that, I will pass it to my colleague, uh, Ife Finch-Floyd, our Director of Economic Justice. Thank you so much, Danny. And again, as a quick reminder, if you have a question, please put your question in the Q&A box below. Okay, next slide. All right, so to start the education section, I'm going to highlight the budget for our youngest learners. And there was a lot of positive movement for childcare, um, especially um, for the lottery funded pre-K program. So let's start with childcare first. 
In fiscal year 2025, there was um, there is about $72 million for child care services, which, among other things, oversees the child care and parent services subsidy program that helps families afford the cost of care. So this 72 million is about nine million is a nine million dollar increase um, that we've seen from the previous fiscal year. And really, as you'll see in another slide, another uh, one of the biggest increases that we've seen in a number of years for this program. So this additional nine million will primarily be used to increase the reimbursement level to child care providers who accept the CAP scholarships. On to the next slide. You'll see the lottery funded pre-K program, which serves up to 84,000 four-year-olds, and it got a major infusion of additional resources from the lottery revenues. Lawmakers agreed to increase pre-K funding by about $98 million. Let's go to the next slide. So most of the proposals um, that are going to be funded in the FY 2025 budget come from the pre-K working group, which was led by Speaker Pro Tem Jan Jones, and also came from the governor's original budget proposal. I'm just gonna highlight a few, but um, all of these are again in the, in the, the printed primer or available on the primer, um, and you can read some of them um, on the slide here. So first, $25 million for a $2,500 increase in the base salary for lead and assistant pre-K teachers. $19.4 million to create more salary alignment between pre-K lead and assistant teachers and their uh, K through 12 counterparts. $9.5 million for the first year of a four-year plan to reduce class sizes from 22 to 20. Um, and a lot of resources to improve operational funds like startup costs and replenishing grants um, for operating uh, those, those uh, uh, pre-K classrooms as well. And then an $11.5 million in additional operation grants to private Georgia pre-K providers. Um, the private providers um, have about half of the pre-K classrooms in the state, and they often need a lot more resources to do uh, what, uh, what K through 12 schools can more easily do. Next slide, please. So while these increases in the FY 2025 budget are certainly welcome, I want to offer a longer term perspective about spending here. So this chart shows the percent change in investment um, for pre-K funding and for child care. The pre-K funding is the blue line and the gold line is child care funding. Uh, with the most recent infusion of resources, pre-K funding has finally doubled since 2004. But child care has not seen the same level of progress. So, for example, if we did not have that $9 million um, increase this year, Georgia's pre-K program would be about where it was 20 years ago. So the, this additional funding, I'm sorry, I lost my, my, my place in my notes here, uh, increased funding by 15% since 2004. We really need major investments in child care. As noted earlier, GBPI has proposed using resources from the undesignated reserve to establish a self-sustaining child care trust fund. Yes, this would take a constitutional amendment, but we really need um, bold ideas here for child care. And we've seen other states make those meaningful investments. Next slide. So child care is an economic, racial, and gender justice issue, like many of the issues that GBPI covers. If you look at this graph, uh, or these sets of graphs, this is GBPI analysis that looks at the cost of infant care in a uh, in center-based setting and how, it's, how it relates to the typical family's income. And we can see that infant care is really expensive for the typical family in 140 counties. That's circled in the top graph above. But if we look at Black and Latino families, the cost of care for an infant takes up more of their incomes um, in most of the counties across the state. Next slide, please. The federal relief investments are winding down and they played a tremendous effort in uh, a, a tremendous part in keeping the child care system afloat during the pandemic. Quality Care for Children conducted a recent survey of more than 500 
uh, providers throughout the state. Um, and you can see the quotes of some of the hardship that providers are experiencing. Uh, quality care for children found that since last year, 47% of ch child care programs uh, had to raise tuition or increase fees. 61% of respondents uh, said they had to establish a wait list, wait list and that impacts uh, infants and toddlers most, um, most acutely. Staffing shortages continue to propose a challenge, and 68% of providers said that if they could uh, hire more qualified teachers, they could serve more children. A GEARS uh, poll, a uh, recent poll, found that eight in 10 families with young children um, experienced challenges um, with childcare, and that impacted their ability to work. Um, some people even said they had to turn down jobs or had to leave the workforce entirely because of childcare challenges, and this disproportionately impacted women. So again, childcare is an economic, racial, and gender justice issue. Now I'll pass it to Ashley. Ashley, you're on mute. I was on mute. Thank you so much. Um, thank you again, Ife. Uh, my name is Ashley Young, Senior Education Policy Analyst here. I just recently acquired the K-12 Education Policy Portfolio uh, while still supporting higher education, um, some of those priorities as well. I'm sure Stephen Owens, my predecessor, would want me to share the following information with gusto, so here it goes. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so Georgia stands out as one of only six states that the nation um, does not allocate additional funding to educate students living in poverty. This remains a very strong uh, priority for GBPI. I provide this context because the last policy we need in Georgia is one that takes funds away from public schools. To understand this issue better, in Georgia, we polled more than 1,800 respondents back in February before House Bill 233 a bill to provide private school vouchers was passed. We did this so that we could gain more insight on what voters thought about private school vouchers. And here are a few key takeaways. First, Georgians believe that the state should actually provide additional support for K-12 schools, especially for those that serve students from families with low incomes. We saw that 76% of of respondents either supported or strongly supported providing additional funding for K-12 school districts that serve majority students in poverty. And when asked, do you support the use of taxpayer money to help um, pay for private education if it reduces funding in public schools? 54.4, as you can see, percent here said no, 34.9% said yes, and 10% were not sure. We already know that this bill will drain millions away from K-12 schools because from 2008 to about 2022, Georgia's existing voucher program has already diverted a total of 1.3 billion to private schools. As we know, there are several systemic policies that impact education and tax policy is one of them. And that's what I will highlight next. This fall, there are about two statewide referendums up for consideration, and this would cap annual assessment increases for homestead property taxes. This pertains to ownership occupied by primary residences, and it would cap them at the rate of inflation. This could essentially restrict the ability of school districts to fund their local schools and cost up to approximately $126 million between private school vouchers, the lack of equitable funding for students living in poverty, and the potential of a cap of local property taxes for public education, public school funding is in a vulnerable space. For a lot of school districts across the state, we must act now as equitable policy advocates to prevent these harmful outcomes. Next slide, please. Growing up in a rural area, I can personally say that my bus ride was about 45 minutes one way and our family heavily depended on school buses. Because of various transportation barriers, it is no surprise that the school districts are required by state to provide school buses to students. As you can see from this graphic here, there is a proportionate, disproportionate gap, excuse me, 
between the total cost of people transportation and the state funding provided to meet this need. Georgia currently has a budget surplus of almost 17 billion, about a third of school buses in the state have been in service for 15 years or more. State funding for pupil transportation like that provided in fiscal year 25 can help shorten the school routes provide and provide um, and improve safety for additional classroom needs. Again, we believe in capturing the thoughts and beliefs of Georgians, which is why when we ask their thoughts on if they would support or oppose the state using surplus funds to replace these buses at a cost of around $850 million, 74% of the respondents voted that they would support or strongly support the state using the surplus to help fund school bus replacement. Next slide, please. Another critical component to equitably invest in public education is teacher pay. This past year, lawmakers thankfully passed a $368 million increase to the state salary schedule for Georgia Public Schools certified employees. Now, the base salary for fiscal year 25 is 43,592 for 10 months of employment. Additionally, uh, the General Assembly voted to include raises of about $2,500. But what I want to point out in this graphic is that despite the cost of living increase, the amount does not keep pace with inflation. So as you can see here, the buying power of the teacher base salary in thousands of dollars is thousands of dollars, excuse me, less than it was 17 years ago. In fact, if salaries kept pace with inflation, teachers base um, salary in 2024 would have made around $7,900 more annually, which amounts to around $395 per pay period. This is increasingly important because Georgia ranks 39th in the nation for average teacher starting salary and 20th for average overall teacher pay. Because teachers are at the heart of public education, paying all teachers fairly and competitively should be a top priority. On the next slide, I will share with you how some district leaders across the state feel about this issue. So in addition to the quantitative and uh, the quantitative data skew, Point, excuse me. I want to share this qualitative data that we gathered from quotes from the superintendent surveys from around the state on what they wish the general public and policymakers knew about funding disparities that lead to inequalities um, in teacher pay. I will read about two of these. So the first one is one leader says, teachers continue to be among the most undervalued people in our workforce for the amount of training and education required. Several of our teachers are working a second job or summer job to supplement their income. And I know this personally as an AP um, Atlanta Public School employee having to work two jobs. The next quote I'll read here is, our shortage of professionally qualified teachers will continue to be a significant barrier to quality education unless pay becomes comparable to that of other careers that require similar levels of education and certifications. Next slide, please. Now for higher education, the 2025 budget for the University System of Georgia and Board of Regents is about $9.7 billion. State general funds allocated to USG's 26 colleges and universities for student instruction, support services, basic college teaching operations total around $3 billion, which is the portion of the budget for our analyses. This year, thankfully, we saw a restoration of the fiscal year 24, 66 million USG formula, form, formula funds, excuse me, because in the 2023 legislative session, all 26 institutions sustained unique reductions. This was a detrimental decrease that came after a 10% USG system-wide cut of $230 million. Next slide, please. Funding public higher education is the key to completing the P-16 education pipeline and is integral to our state's workforce. However, Georgia has experienced major financial cutbacks over the years. The USG funding formula provides that education costs be calculated based on a credit hour production shared between the state and the students, with, state, with the state generally covering around 75% and students usually around 25%. But in the 2023-24 academic year, the state only funded 57% of the public higher education that you see here in this graph, 18% less than the USG funding formula, formula promises. Another way to look at this, the state has not fully funded four-year higher education since 2001. Now, y'all, sadly, this was the year I started high school, and my class will be celebrating our 20-year class reunion. So in other words, it's been a while. 
This creates many barriers to college access and success for many students who are racially and financially marginalized. For instance, Georgia is one of two states that does not offer need-based aid. And with tuition rates increasing in, um, in this school year, and the state's only funding 57% of public higher education, many students cannot access college, not because they are not academically qualified, but because they simply cannot afford it. Next slide, please. And a little bit more of good news, um, the technical college system plays an instrumental role in our workforce development, preparing thousands of employees to enter into critical jobs that keep our state safe, clean and functional among many other benefits. The technical college system of Georgia, we see an increase in 14 out of the 22 schools. So that is something to be proud of. Half of the schools, excuse me, saw an increase of over 100 students. Only one school reported flat enrollment and that was North Georgia Technical College. Next slide, please. Of the seven, only seven colleges, which you see here, experienced a decrease in enrollment. Despite these changes, the technical college system of Georgia saw a total of 1,770 new students. Enrollment is headed in the right direction and more access to technical education. Students across the state can enroll in a program that best suits their interests as they look to transition to the workforce. Next slide, please. Now for some big ticket items in the education lottery. This year's budget for public school programs included a $12 million reduction to align funding with expected program expenditures. This re reflects funding for Hope Scholarship at a 100% factor rate. Additionally, lawmakers voted for a 17 million transfer from the Hope Scholarship to the, uh, for USG schools to the Hope Grants Program for the technical college institutions. As a result, these changes decreased the Hope Scholarship bu budget from around 875 million to 846 million for FY25. The Hope Scholarship for private institutions also saw a decrease from 91 million to 75 million. This is also due to reductions in expected program expenditures for the Hope private award rate um, from 25.96 and a Hope Zell Miller private award around 29.85. Lastly, the HOPE grants for two-year uh, colleges experienced a net $4 million reduction, so that was $21 million, decreased to reflect expected program expenditures and about $17 million increase in transfer funds, again, as I mentioned earlier, from the HOPE scholarship. The HOPE grant program's uh, fiscal year 2025 is a total of $77 million, down from around $81 million in fiscal year 24. Now for my last slide, um, the education lottery reserves. The total reserves now stand at 2.2 billion. Around 773 million is required in case of a shortfall to be able to fund the, fund the HOPE scholarships, which I just spoke about. An additional 1.4 billion is considered in is um, considered unrestricted reserves. So the current total lottery reserves has nearly doubled um, since 2020 from 1.3 billion to 2.2 billion currently. There are so many higher education policy changes that we believe the education lottery could be useful in supporting from the college completion grants um, to the comprehensive need-based aid program, all of which can mit mitigate student loan debt crisis in Georgia and reduce stress and time to degree to completion. These factors are not only deserving, um, but for deserving students, excuse me, but for academically qualified students, um, they keep them from attending college. But it has also landed Georgia number three in the U.S. for average student loan debt per borrower, behind Washington, D.C. and Maryland, respectively, with an average of $41,951, the most of any southeastern state which totals around $69 billion total for student loan debt in Georgia. Now, I know that was a lot of information and data, but I thank you for hanging in there with me. Um, this concludes my budget primer portion for K-12 and higher education. I will now turn it over to Leah Chan, our Director of Health Justice. Hi, good afternoon. Next slide. So in the budget primer, we cover the state's three primary health agencies. And it's a lot of information and a lot of it we won't actually be able to cover today. So I really encourage you all 
to read the full primer on our website if you want a deeper dive on some of these health topics. So over time, our state has restructured to create three distinct health agencies focused on health care and public health systems. The Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, which operates state hospitals and provides community-based services to Georgians living with mental health conditions, substance use disorders, and developmental disabilities. The Department of Community Health, which administers our state's Medicaid and Peach Care programs that provide health care co coverage for folks with lower incomes. And our Department of Public Health, um, which operates fo programs focused on disease and injury prevention, health promotion, and health-related disaster response and preparedness. So general fund appropriations for the Department of Community Health have more than doubled over the past 20 years. Similarly, general fund appropriations for Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities and Department of Public Health have also more than doubled since their inception in fiscal years 2010 and 2012, respectively. So for fiscal year 2025, Georgia plans to spend 7.3 billion in state funds for these three agencies. That accounts for about one in every five state dollars projected to be spent in the new fiscal year. And as you can see from the graph, the lion's share of state health spending goes toward Department of Community Health, which is about 72% of state health spending compared to a mere 6% at Department of Public Health. Next slide. So the pandemic really put tremendous pressure on the workforce at our state health agencies. However, um, some sustained compensation adjustments since 2023 have contributed to decreases in these three health agencies' turnover rates. And those compensation ad adjustments will be further augmented by the cost of living increase in this new budget. But despite these gains, um, the higher than average uh, percentage of percentage of employees who are eligible for full retirement within the next five years at all three agencies really presents additional challenges. So we know that continued efforts are really necessary to ensure our state agencies are fully staffed with a trained, diverse, and stable workforce ready to meet Georgia's ever-shifting health needs. Next slide. So a really bright spot in this year's budget are the efforts being made to adjust reimbursement rates to ensure community-based providers are compensated adequately for the critical health care and behavioral health services they provide, with the state funding increases actually showing up across all three state health agency budgets. So many of these rate increases are intended to improve pay, particularly wages for hourly workers. And the rate increases may also improve access to care for Georgians with lower incomes ultimately. So the largest chunk of funding, as you can see, that first line will go towards increasing reimbursement rates that will allow home and community-based care workers to be paid a living wage, which has long been a barrier to filling additional waiver slots that allow Georgians with disabilities to be served and thrive with dignity in their homes and communities. Next slide. So I'd like to switch gears and talk specifically about state funding for healthcare under the Department of Community Health. So first, just a little bit of background. So unequal access to affordable, high quality um, healthcare continues to impact Georgians. Our state ranks third nationally in the number of uninsured people. So almost one in six non-elderly adults and about one in 16 children in the state are uninsured across all income levels. The burden really falls heaviest on Georgians living in rural communities and Georgians of color, particularly Latinx Georgians. Next slide. So Medicaid and Peach Care serve about 2 million Georgians. Low-income Medicaid serves children, pregnant and postpartum people, and some parents with very low incomes. The age, blind, and disabled portion of the program serves older adults with low incomes and people with physical and developmental disabilities. Peach Care is a separate program serving children from families with incomes that are actually above the Medicaid threshold, but who often lack access to other forms of coverage. And then Pathways to Coverage serves low-income adults not eligible for traditional Medicaid who work, go to school, and are enrolled in higher education for about 80 hours per month. And that sort of, that funding is rolled up into the low-income Medicaid program. So Georgia expects to send, spend a, almost $5 billion in overall state funds in the new fiscal year 2025 to serve Georgians who are covered by Medicaid and Peach Care. 
Children make up about 69% of the Georgians who are covered, but most of the spending goes toward healthcare for older adults and individuals living with disabilities. So one really exciting um, win, sort of buried deep within this year's budget, is 10.5 million in state funding to offer dental coverage to Medicaid eligible adults. And so for those of, among us that have teeth, you know how important oral health is for overall wellness. And research also demonstrates its impact on other life outcomes like employment opportunities. So this is really a critical step in connecting low-income Georgians with the full spectrum of healthcare coverage that they deserve. Next slide. So as many of you know, over the past year, Georgia, like all their states, went through a really seismic shift in our um, public healthcare system that has impacted people's ability to access care and impacted our state's bottom line. So this shift is known as the Medicaid unwinding. So thanks to a pandemic era federal policy, millions of Georgians had uninterrupted access to affordable health care from about 2020 to 2023. Last spring, that continuous coverage began to unwind and every child and adult enrolled in Georgia's healthcare safety net was supposed to have their eligibility redetermined over the course of about a year. So let's start with how this impacted our budget. Georgia was able to pull down additional federal dollars in exchange for keeping Georgians enrolled in coverage. And those federal dollars brought fiscal relief to our state and more than offset the state cost of Medicaid coverage for the Georgians that got added during the pandemic. The federal government started stair-stepping down the enhanced match last April, and we returned to our standard match rate in January of this year. So the fiscal year 2025 budget reflects that return to a standard match, with the federal government now paying 66 cents on the dollar compared to the 72 cents on the dollar it was paying uh, during the pandemic. So the Medicaid unwinding has also had a significant human impact. The fiscal year 2025 budget includes shifts to reflect projected enrollment declines associated with the Medicaid unwinding. But the picture that lies beneath those line items is far more complex. So based on the most current data available from the state, which you can see on this slide, almost 600,000 Georgians have lost their Medicaid eligibility since the start of the unwinding. A majority, about half a million, have lost it for procedural reasons, which means there was some sort of paperwork or technology issue. And one of the most concerning outcomes of the Medicaid unwinding is the impact on children. So although the state does not share disenrollment data by age, we know that based on CMS data that between April of 2023, when the unwinding began, and April of 2024, about one in every five children enrolled in Medicaid and Peach Care have been disenrolled. Some of those children may have aged out. Some, um, some of their families may have found other forms of coverage. However, likely many of those children lost coverage for procedural reasons and are still eligible. So these coverage losses have likely not been felt equally across all communities. Due to an equitable access to economic security for their parents and families, Black and Latinx children and children living in rural communities are overrepresented in Medicaid and Peach Care and thus more likely to be impacted by the Medicaid unwinding. And these temporary losses in healthcare coverage can put tremendous pressure on these families who are already struggling to make ends meet, forcing families to choose between filling a much needed prescription and putting food on the table. So although the Medicaid unwinding is over, it has revealed weaknesses in our healthcare and public benefit enrollment systems that have long been neglected. And moving forward, there are policies that our state legislature can put into place and systems changes our state agencies can adopt to ensure that stay work, state workers stay protected from unmanageable workloads and children and adults stay covered. Next slide. So closing the coverage gap in whatever we, way we do that, whether the state decides to do so by enrolling uninsured low-income adults in Medicaid or by buying them qualified health plans on the marketplace. Closing the coverage gap would unlock billions in federal dollars for our state, create tens of thousands of new jobs, prevent rural hospital closures, and so much more. It really remains a fiscally responsible choice that will deliver life-saving life healthcare coverage to hundreds of thousands of Georgians. Instead, we are currently implementing a program that costs more and covers fewer people. So the enrollment figures from the Pathways to Coverage program, which launched last summer, 
signify a missed opportunity for expanding health access in our state. With less than 2% of the eligible population reached and countless Georgians still outside the healthcare safety net, it's clear that we need a more inclusive and streamlined approach. And we encourage you to visit um, uh, georgiapathways.org to learn a bit a little bit more about that. Um, and I will pass it over now to my colleague, Hilary Dong. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, since this is a new policy area for GBPI, I just want to level set for a second about why investments in housing are so important to health. Having access to safe, affordable, and stable housing has significant implications for people's health, health income uh, outcomes. Safe and stable housing is associated with improved health as well as lower health care costs, whereas unsafe and unstable housing can contribute to mental and physical health problems. For example, lead poisoning can affect brain and nervous system development in children. Having leaks or poor ventilation in your home can create mold, which can affect and exacerbate respiratory conditions such as asthma and stressors such as living in a home that you know is making you sick or facing the threat of eviction can take a huge negative toll on someone's mental health. Not only that, but high housing costs are leaving families and individuals with less money to pay for other necessities such as food and medicine. Research has shown that people will forego medical care in order to pay for their housing costs. And we've seen this reflected in some of the research we've done at GBPI, where we've interviewed folks about their access to healthcare, and they've said that they can't even think about going to see the doctor or treating their medical conditions because they're too worried about trying to keep a roof over their head. And this is especially important to note here in Georgia because nearly half of all Georgia renters experience housing cost burden, meaning that they're spending over 30, at least 30% of their income on housing costs and about a quarter are actually spending half or more of their income on housing costs. And this disproportionately affects Georgians of color, specifically black and Latinx Georgians as well. All this is to say that investments in housing are investments in health. And with that, I wanna take a look at how housing shows up in the FY 2025 state budget. Um, state funds for housing are largely administered through the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, DBHDD, as well as the Department of Community Affairs, DCA. This largest chunk that we see here in this pie chart is for the Georgia Housing Voucher Program, um, which was established in, as a result of the 2010 Olmstead Settlement Agreement which required uh, the state to house 9,000 individuals with severe and persistent mental illness. Um, and the program is administered by DBHDD. Um, despite the requirement for the state to house at least 9,000 individuals, as of April 2023, the Georgia Housing Voucher Program was housing um, just over 2,000. And despite us being way under that target of 9,000 individuals, the Georgia Housing Voucher Program remains level funded in the FY 2025 state budget, meaning it received no increase from the previous fiscal year's budget. Um, the House did try to include a $2.5 million increase for the program in this year's budget. However, that was zeroed out by the Senate and uh, agreed to in conference committee as the state awaits a response from the Department of Justice regarding the state's compliance with the Olmstead Settlement Agreement. Um, but I'm sure you guys can tell for yourselves, we are not meeting that um, goal, that target, when it comes to the supporting housing, uh, supportive housing part of that agreement. The next biggest uh, sum that we see here is for the State Housing Trust Fund for the Homeless, which is administered by DCA. The State Housing Trust Fund for the Homeless received a $4.6 million increase this year, um, over doubling its budget from FY 2024. And this is a great step in the right direction. Um, these additional funds will be used for improving homelessness services, as well as allowing the agency to pursue more federal grant opportunities, which is important to note because the majority of DCA's budget is coming from federal funds, about 68%. Only about a quarter of DCA's budget is coming from those state funds. And lastly, we see here the Accountable Housing Initiative, which is being administered through the State Housing Trust Fund. Um, it received a million dollars in this year's budget, and it is a result of the House Majority Leader's Bill HB 1410, um, which created a voluntary transitional housing program for up to 18 months and requires participants to 
agree to conditions such as sobriety from drugs and alcohol, um, mental health and substance use disorder treatment, work, job training, um, yeah, and things like that. Um, this is the House Majority Leader's response to housing first approaches, which have been proven to be the best way to um, allow homeless people to leave homelessness. So it'll be interesting to see how effective this program um, is actually able to be in the next year. So with all this in mind, next slide, um, the bottom line is that Georgia is not investing very much money into uh, housing and Georgia needs to increase its state investment in housing in order to meet the, the state's housing needs. We're spending less on housing than other states. Currently, we rank 32nd for state expenditures on housing and community development per capita behind neighboring states, including Tennessee and South Carolina. Um, we need further investments into the Georgia Housing Voucher Program in order to meet those requirements set out by the Olmstead Settlement Agreement. And while it's great to see those increased investments in the State Housing Trust Fund for the homeless, and while those investments are certainly a step in the right direction, they're just one step. And we need to ensure that we are continuing to push for increased, uh, increased funding and investment in housing in order to ensure that all Georgians have access to safe, affordable, and stable housing. And with that, I will pass it on to my colleague, Ife Finch Floyd for Human Services. Thank you so much, Hillary. So the fiscal year 2025 budget includes about $1 billion for the Department of Human Services. And this is about a 4% increase from what we saw last year. So those additional uh, $43 million um, in the budget include, but are not limited to, 15 million for the 4% cost of living adjustment for all state employees, and this is specifically for DHS employees, and uh, 7 million for an additional salary increase for caseworkers in child welfare, elderly abuse investigations and prevention services, child support services, and law enforcement officers working with the Georgia Vocational Rehabilitation Agency. It also includes 4.9 million for the Gwinnett Commercial Sexual Exploitation Recovery Center. Next slide. So on, the, on this slide, we see Department of Human Services uh, really oversees a number of different agencies um, and offices, foster care, child welfare, and adopt, <laughs> adoption services, support for low-income individuals, aging services, and child support. There are also four, um, four other agencies that are attached to the DHS budget for administration reasons. And those include the Council on Aging, Georgia Re Vocational Rehabilitation Agency, Family Connect, and the Safe Harbor for Sexually Exploited Children Fund Commission. You can see that foster care, adoption, and child welfare services make up the vast majority of the DHS budget. Next slide. So as I noted before, all qualified state workers got a cost of living adjustment. However, frontline case workers for child welfare services, elderly abuse investigation and prevention services and child support got an additional $3,000 uh, pay bump. Uh, GBPI was certainly supportive of, of that. However, DFAX eligibility workers who process uh, Medicaid, TANF, SNAP, uh, uh, applications and cases um, did not get this increase. And this is a part of a longer term trend of DFAX eligibility workers just not seeing the same level of pay increases as their counterparts um, in the def um, on the other side of DFAX in the child welfare agency. So if we look at this trend line, these trend lines, which so show the percent, excuse me, percent change in um, base salary adjusted for inflation and since 2017, fiscal year 2017. The gold represents uh, DFAX child welfare caseworkers and the blue represents DFAX eligibility workers. We see uh, towards the beginning of the trend line and towards the end of the trend line, really big, much larger increases in pay for those child welfare caseworkers um, and also um, uh, towards the end uh, of, the, of the trend line. 
Um, but overall, I'll note that these trends still follow a similar trajectory because overall, the state is not making those um, those needed investments in staff the way they need to. But in particular, going back to eligibility workers, the 7% increase since 2017 is really concerning. Um, and we want to, I'm going to talk a little bit about why that matters on the next slide. So to support Medicaid unwinding, as my colleague Leah Chan noted earlier, DFAC's uh, Office of Family Independence focused on aggressive hiring. And since the start of January 2023, the agency hired more than 1,200 staff. This is a fantastic uh, accomplishment, um, and we need to continue to support hiring in DFAC's and DHS and at the state um, all over. However, retention is still a very big issue. So I want to just show you an example of, of what this looks like. In January 2023, the fiscal year average head count uh, was 1,745. This is among eligibility caseworkers. And in May 2024, that's the most recent month GBPI has available data, the fiscal year average head count was 20, uh, 2,194. That's a difference of 449 uh, total staffing, despite the 1,200 people that were hired. In May 2024, there was about a 21% um, turnover rate, which was a slight is a slight improvement than what we saw in 2022, but is still a relatively high level of turnover. And you can see in the pie chart um, that most of the turnover is among staff who have been in the job for a year or less. Um, so yes, these are the exact same people <laughs> that um, DHS has been working hard to hire over the past couple of years. Next slide, please. So again, why does this matter? Well, this matters because we have what I call a front door issue, and that is um, a lot of barriers to accessing benefits. The cost of living is rising for, for all Georgians and people who work in low wage jobs or can't work as much as they want to because they are caring for others or maybe they have a health issue, they can't access those critical programs um, that help them afford the, afford the cost of food or to get health coverage. So applying for benefits um, and many people are are encouraged to, to apply for benefits online through our gateway system, it's really not as easy for it seem, as it seems. And that's even the case for people who are very tech savvy. A lot of folks have questions about their applications or about renewing their case, and they can't talk to anybody. They may have to call a, a call center and go through kind of this black hole of moving, uh, being transitioned from one line to another, can't reach their caseworker because the, the voicemail is full, or they try to go into a DFAX office and no one is there except for the front desk person who cannot answer specific questions about their case. Um, so because they can't figure out what they need to do for the case or ha have trouble understanding what DFAX is asking them to do, um, they may uh, be denied access to SNAP, Medicaid, or TANF. Again, it's for those reasons that Leah talked about, not because they don't qualify, but because of those procedural reasons. And we heard a lot of this during Medicaid Unwinding. And you can see this snapshot from a news, uh, a news clipping that shows that there was, there's also been a big snap backlog um, over the past couple of years. DFAX has really been working hard to improve it, but this backlog of means people were not getting their benefits on time, sometimes waiting weeks, if not months, um, to get those SNAP benefits to help put food on the table. Um, while there are a number of reasons why we had the SNAP backlog, one of the key reasons is the workforce shortage. Um, so I am going to pause there, happy to answer more questions, and pass it over to my colleague, Ray Calfani, our Senior Analyst for Criminal Legal System at Work or Justice. Thanks. Thank you, Ife. I, I appreciate it. I want to make sure, hope I'm able to be seen. Um, so I'll go right in and, and, and I'll be highlighting the budgets today um, and the equity implications for the Georgia Department of Labor and the Georgia Department of Corrections. And starting with the Georgia Department of Labor, which I believe is never a wrong time um, to discuss them, particularly because they usually 
they usually um, you know, only get the spotlight when unemployment levels are high. So as a state agency that administers an unemployment insurance program that provides wage protections for those who lose a job and no fault of their own, uh, which helps maintain economic stability during recessions, and whose ability to provide these protections is tied to how it builds benefit reserves on unemployment is low, you know, this is, an, it just is, is uh, an opportune time as ever to look at its fiscal choices as unemployment in Georgia still holds at relatively low levels. Therefore, I'm not only going to highlight how the state spends investments for the Department of Labor, but also how it gathers them. And, and one thing, we should never lose sight of the fact that you know, pandemic investments in, investments in the Department of Labor helped Georgia's economy recover more quickly from, from the last economic downturn. Its temporary expansion to, to, to UI prevented more Georgia workers from getting trapped in low-quality jobs that would have depressed their lifetime earnings. Now, looking back over the last 20 years, state spending within the, within the Department of Labor's Unemployment Insurance Division has declined by, by 30%. And reduce state investments in the division tasked with administering benefits and collecting employer contributions, particularly as state funding helps stabilize the ebbs and flow of federal funding that comes to the Department of Labor. These are concerning fiscal choices. And what's even more concerning is the decades of long of the, de the decades long partial allocation of what's known as administrative assessment revenue to the Department of Labor. And for those who aren't familiar with that term. Administrative assessment is one of two revenue streams provided by employer contributions that fund Georgia's unemployment insurance system. And administrative assessment revenue can be used, you know, to fund Department of Labor operations or the Georgia or the the Georgia un, the sorry the unemployment insurance trust fund, while the other revenue stream is solely dedicated to funding the trust fund. Now. With that context, each fiscal year budget is, is, is based on administrative assessment re revenue collections from two years earlier. And this is where we will begin to see how the math ain't math. So follow me on this. So in fiscal year 2022, administrative assessment revenue collections totaled more than $23 million, while state lawmakers chose to only allocate $8.1 million to the Department of Labor in the corresponding year, which is two years later than that, fiscal year 2024. So that's $15 million that could have gone to the Department of Labor last year, but instead was left in the state's general fund, despite the fact that Georgia has been running on a surplus for quite some time, as Danny mentioned earlier. So imagine adding, adding these yearly funding gaps, which may be more or less than last year's $15 million funding gap, and we could be looking at tens or maybe hundreds of millions of dollars that could have gone to the Department of Labor Operations or to the trust fund to supply benefits, but didn't. So now let's go to the next slide. So when we look at fiscal year 2025's Department of Labor budget, which is about $8.6 million to fund, you know, to fund its operations, there, there are a couple of things that stand out. One is the Department of Labor is in the process of a large-scale modernization effort to, you know, to, to improve its to its improve its customer service, this customer service portal and improve its, its UI benefit claims processing technology. Second, Department of Labor increased spending by about 443,000 for cost of living increases for their staff, which we hope can help them keep pace with inflation and also help to retain and attract more staff. And third, Department of Labor is using existing state funding levels to shift about $2 million in funds that would otherwise be available for its UI, for its unemployment insurance division to support large scale modernization. So go to the next slide, please. And so thinking about that, if, if the fact that the Department of Labor's large scale modernization is being supplemented through the shifting of existing funding levels instead of new state funding allocations, or the fact that millions of dollars are being generated by the Department of Labor but not fully allocated to them, here are some other highlights on why the Department of Labor investments, on why Department of Labor investments must become a higher priority for lawmakers. Now, even for the, you know, up to this month, you know, when unemployed workers are still filing very low levels of claims, the Department of Labor is still not performing at the federal baseline for processing initial payments of claimants. If we go to the next slide. And in that, when we think about our unemployment insurance trust fund, as of this month, which has about close to $1.9 billion in reserves to, to pay benefits, let's keep in mind that number needs some perspective. So based on an average of the last couple of recessions, that $1.8, $1.9 billion will cover UI benefit payouts for about six months of a recession, while the federal standard is to have enough to pay out at least a year. We'll go to the next slide. And just a couple more data points to keep in mind when you think about, you know, the, the state of working Georgia. 
um, or, or why it's, you know, why we must place more focus on strengthening the resilience of the Department of Labor and unemployment insurance system that serves workers across the state. Going into the next slide, we'll see that Black and Hispanic Georgians, who both face a structurally race, racist labor market in Georgia, that impacts their wages, their career mobility, their opportunities to build wealth, and their overall economic security, they both comprise rising shares of the state's labor force since 2019, meaning they both have more to lose if and when the economy slows down and they need to turn to our unemployment insurance system for help. On to the next slide. And when we think about just overall unemployment in Georgia, it's still low. However, the black-white unemployment gap has been growing since mid-2022 when we saw historic lows. So now going into to the next slide and then transitioning into the um, Georgia Department of Corrections and jumping right in, I'll start by saying that, you know, just comparing that to, to the last agency, while, while you know, policymakers have, have yet to adequately invest in the Department of Labor and, and, and modernizing that agency to better protect workers and their mobility, they continue to prioritize upping investments in our prison system, which coerces most incarcerated Georgians into providing unpaid, unprotected labor while taxing the pennies per hour that a few of them get who are transitioning out of incarceration uh, and who are working. Uh, now, going to, in, to the next slide and to the numbers for 2025, you know, they're, they're, they're substantially higher as far as spending from 20 years ago as state prison spending has grown by 70%. And that includes the last three years of consecutive increases in spending to cover staff pay, infrastructure, security upgrades, and prison health care spending. And then going into the last slide, I'm just going a little bit deeper in those numbers for fiscal year 2025. You know, the overall spending is about 166 million higher than, than the last fiscal year, which includes more than 50 million added for security and infrastructure upgrades, 43 million added to boost staff pay, 72 million added to boost health and health and pharmacy contracts, and about 240,000 to boost vocational education contracts. And for all of this, this spending is going to expand incarceration. None of that funding reduces the added financial burdens on incarcerated Georgians, you know, including the majority share of them that are subjected to being forced to supply the state's public and private sectors with labor for zero pay, yet have to having to pay tons of fees for basic necessities and their ability to, to pay these fees largely determine the fate of their mental and physical health. So the last thing I'll say before I turn it over is that, you know, when we think about who typically pays those fees that I mentioned, it's oftentimes their loved ones on the outside, many of whom face risk of being saddled with other criminal legal system fines and fees, as dozens of cities across the state abusive, abusively rely on criminal legal system fines and fees to balance their budgets. So I'll stop there and I'll pass it back there. Thank you so much, Ray. And thank you to all the analysts who shared your insights today. So uh, now we're gonna turn it to the audience. You just heard about how our budget works, continued staffing issues throughout Georgia state government and more. So if you have questions about the topics that we covered today, you can go ahead and please use the Q&A function and place your questions there and we'll make sure to get them answered here or um, we will reach out to you via email following the event. So I'll jump in with a few questions that we already have, but please feel free to still drop your questions in the chat. So the first question will be for Ife. How should DFAX's Office of Family Independence improve its customer service in the next few years? Uh, thanks so much. Um... Aaron, for the question. Um, so first, we really need some political will to improve access to economic security programs. Um, and that means really continuing to invest in DHS and DFAC staff through higher compensation. Yes, that means pay. But um, recently, we also passed um, an expansion to the state paid leave law, which extended paid parental leave um, from three weeks to six weeks, which is which is fantastic. But we need to see more policies like that to make it uh, uh, working for the state and working for DFACs and DHS in particular more attractive. It also means making sure that they have the professional development they need and they can see clear career pathways. 
Additionally, we need to focus on human-centered design in the technology that we are utilizing. Um, sometimes the technology is the issue, but it can be the solution to um, a lot of uh, the problems that we have. So in doing that, when we think about human-centered design, that means a, 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 a complete focus or um, a major focus on the end user and what is easiest for them to engage with the system. So that means um, utilizing, making sure um, that the functionality is, is accessible, making sure the language is accessible, um, and then on the point of language, making sure that um, there are different language options and translation interpretation services widely available for people who are limited English proficiency clients. Um, that also means thinking about people with disabilities as well and making sure um, that any technology is, is keeping their needs in mind. Um, again, moving, keeping with the technology theme, many of the clients who are accessing benefits at DFACS, you don't have computers, right? They actually use mobile devices. So using those mobile devices even more, using text messages, making sure there are apps with all the functionality or making websites um, mobile friendly, um, that is another piece um, to, to improve access. But also we can't ignore that we still need to have offices where people can come in and just ask a question about their case um, and what that and what that looks like. So I know that one of the benefits for working for DFACS is because a lot of the work is remote and that is an important benefit. But I think we can find a through line here where there is a hybrid approach. There may be some in-office days where you're face-to-face -face with clients in person, but you can also think about, again, a person going into the office and there being a video conferencing or some sort. So there are some, um, I think, some ways to, to, to thread the needle to make sure that clients are continuously being served in the way they um, are expected to be served, right, by federal rules and obligations, um, and also making sure that um, that workers um, get some benefits as well. And then the final thing I'll say is we need to simplify some of the unnecessary and burdensome rules um, that so we can reduce the burden, not just on clients, but on state workers as well. Thanks so much, Ife, for that super thorough answer. Um, the, my next question is for Leah. So can you tell us what you think is missing in this year's health budget? Yeah, thanks for that question, Erin. So, I mean, I think one glaring omission from this year's budget is um, a reflection of um, uh, our decision to yet again um, not expand uh, access to healthcare in our state. So, um, if we were to fully close the coverage gap, we would be drawing down billions of additional federal dollars that would show up in our state budget. Um, we know from um, a state fiscal note that the uh, state auditor put out this year that those additional federal dollars would help offset state costs at other state agencies like the Department of Corrections, um, like the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, so that those agencies could use that money for other critical needs at the at those um, particular state agencies. Um, so there's so many ways in which um, uh, fully closing the coverage gap could really stimulate our economy and positively impact our state budget. And that is really what's missing, I think, in sort of the, um, the health space this year. Thank you, Leah. So, um... Talking about legislative session, we got a question for several of you. Um, do you have any insights into the potential legislative agendas for 2025? What might they address um, in education, housing, or healthcare? So um, if anybody has any thoughts about things that might have come up in their portfolio area that they expect to see again in 2025, please feel free to jump in. Well, I, I think, you know, one area to lead off, and I saw another similar question to this in the chat of how, how can folks 
help influence the agenda. Uh, and right now, it, it's very likely that your state representative, your state senator, or hopefuls for that office are holding events in the district, are looking to talk to people to meet them ahead of November. Uh, and certainly, this is a tool uh, where where you can you can look in the primary, you can look at lo what the state is doing right now, where those gaps exist, and take those issues uh, to the folks seeking to represent you. Um, certainly, um, now is a time where where they're going to be more attuned to those concerns and and listening to people who are in their districts. I'll also say, much like in recent years, uh, the budget is front and center, uh, and our surplus has only continued to grow. Uh, we're going from where we were uh, at the start of the year, about $16 billion, uh, now to about $17 billion. Uh, and so rather than putting those funds to use across many of the things that have been suggested today, healthcare, education, child care, we have chosen uh, to add to those funds, to, to hold back from our capacity uh, and not to invest in Georgians. Um, and so we have a greater uh, historic opportunity uh, where we are better positioned than ever before to make those investments. Uh, and certainly, uh, no one can say that we do not have the resources available to do so. Can I can I add to that? Um, so uh, last session, the Senate um, approved legislation to create a child care uh, study committee. Um, and it will begin meeting late summer, early fall. Um, and, um, you know, I know a lot of um, ECE advocates will be engaged in that study, commi study committee, and hopefully there will be some useful conversation and useful dialogue about how we can make stronger investments in childcare um, certainly reducing the costs for families, but also making sure that we're making investments in the providers so that uh, providers can have more resources to hire the teachers um, that they need um, and to make sure that we're building a system that's better for kids and better for families and better for childcare workers in general. So that conversation is gonna be starting later this year, um, but that is hopefully an opportunity um, the, and um, hopefully we can see some legislation or maybe some um, different budget line items as a result of those conversations. Great, thank you so much. Does anybody else, um, any of the other analysts wanna weigh in on 2025? Ashley, I see you came off mute. Yes, I can quickly say um, just from the higher education side, we certainly saw some interest um, from our legislators to begin utilizing the education lottery a bit more. So um, Senate Bill 526, which is the good faith grant was proposed um, with bipartisan support. And this would help bring comprehensive need-based aid to Georgians. So this is a pretty transformative bill and it would take excuse me, a lot of support, a lot of time, a lot of cultivation, um, but there were certainly interest um, from some leaders on the Senate higher ed side um, in terms of making this uh, sort of dream a reality in Georgia. Um, we also saw some interest from the Republican side on expanding the college completion grant and sort of um, making that eligibility more accessible for students who had completed less um, credit hours. And so we are seeing from both um, Democrats and Republicans in both chambers interest in utilizing that um, education lottery, those uh, education lottery reserves to help make college more accessible for, for students across the state. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, Hillary, I believe you wanted to weigh in. Yeah. Um, so this last legislative session, we saw a bill HB 1182, I believe, that would have sought to um, cut the low income housing tax credit, which the state low income housing tax credit is basically some of the only money that the state uses to construct um, affordable housing. Um, the bill didn't go through this year. Georgia currently has a dollar for dollar match um, to the federal low income housing tax credit, but there is a chance that the bill could pop up again next year. Um, so that's maybe a thing for anyone who's interested in housing to just keep on their radar um, because Georgia is in a position where um, we don't have enough affordable housing. There's a Harvard study that showed uh, that um, between like 2019 and 2021, Georgia is actually one of the states that experienced 
some of the greatest decreases in affordable housing um, in the country. So um, if you're a housing person or you're interested in housing advocacy, that is maybe something that I would just say to keep in mind because what we need at this moment is more funding for housing, not to be cutting anywhere. Thanks so much, Hillary. Uh, Ray? You yeah, I would say one other thing. You know, last year there was an attempt to address a very important issue around public safety and school zones, particularly like pedestrian safety, safety for children. Um, and you know, there was an attempt to 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 use automated traffic and enforcement, uh, you know, speeding devices to be able to um, think looking at that to be a way to be able to address a public safety issue that's there. Uh, I would say that, you know, it's, it's a bit more, you know, complex than just that. And it's something that we certainly need to think about um, in terms of, you know, how we address road design issues, along with other ways to be able to reduce, um, you know, to disincentivize the behavior to, to, to speed in school zones, which is an important safety issue that we must address. But we also must think about, you know, the other potential effects it can have on other types of mon monetary enforcement that already exists in our state. Georgia is one of the worst states in the country when it turns to relying on um, various forms of, of fines and fees, whether that's you know traffic fines and fees, which in this state can be criminalized if you're not able to pay them you know, up front, and which can lead to being in um, into into Georgia's misdemeanor probation system. Um, and, and when we think about that already being in existence and layering on some, a, another form of monetary enforcement, you know, to, to address a public safety need, I think, you know, lawmakers and, and in us all, you know, we, we must think about, you know, it, it's a little bit more complex. And we, we certainly need to think about the other the other parts of that issue to make sure that, you know, we're addressing the road design issues that can often lead to, you know, speeding through school zones and think about how we can change road design along with thinking about, you know, what's needed to be able to stop the behavior so that we can make sure that we're not only, you know, improving public safety, but we're not lay layering on, you know, more layers of um, inequity when it comes to, you know, those who can fall into, whether that, you know, we already have a system where people can, can be criminalized or not paying traffic fines um, outside of speeding zones in school, 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 I'm sorry outside of school zone speeding situations. And then with that, you know, that can be something that could add more civic, uh, more civil penalties to that, which can just layer on to, to some of the inequity. So it's something to think about um, because it's, it's a complex issue that's more than just, just turning to monetary enforcement to stop it. So you talked about a lot of things related to uh, the Department of Corrections, Ray. Um, was there anything specific related to reentry services that was called out? Oh, uh, uh, well, well, I mean, what, what I'll say is, I mean, I, I know that, you know, for those who were um, transitioning out of out of state prisons who were still there, who were in transition centers, you know, there, you know, there's still not enough for them to be able to to. To reasonably reenter, to easily reenter society and be able to to rebuild their lives, um, you know, there's 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 certainly tons of exploitation that takes place with those who are formerly incarcerated and seeking work. Um, and oftentimes only have choices to go into exploitative jobs, um, which just worsen the type of experiences, you know, the mental and physical health, um, you know, challenges that they may have that may have started in prison or were exacerbated in prison. So um, when you think about reentry services, reentry situations, uh, there's certainly more that needs to be done to make sure that one, you know, we're not discriminating upon those who are, you know, who have been formerly incarcerated and who have paid um, you know, who, who have served their time. Um, we need to make sure that they have equal footing to be able to, hey, now that they have served their time, they need to be able to have access to opportunity just like anyone else. Thanks so much, Ray. So um, I just want to acknowledge, we have a few, I know we're winding down right now, but we have a few questions in the chat. Um, that will be better served with like us sharing resources with you directly, et cetera. So we'll make sure to follow up on those. Um, and if you did submit your question, that's more of a resource question as an anonymous attendee, um, I'll reach out in the chat just to say, would you like to share your contact information to make sure we can get that question answered? But with that said, I will throw it back over to Stacy. Thanks, Erin. And thanks, team. Great job today. Um, and thank you all for joining us online. 
uh, it was just an amazing opportunity for us to get to share our hard work with you and y'all to get a sense of what it is we do at GBPI every day and um, a little bit of look into this brilliant team and the work that they do. And thank you for the engaging questions online. As Aaron said, all participants registered today will get a copy of this video. We'll, um, we'll link it to our YouTube channel, as well as we take a little bit of time to try to flesh out answers that showed up in the chat that we were unable to answer or just want to reiterate for all the participants. So expect to see that in your inbox. Just a reminder to you that it, uh, we are a nonprofit organization. It takes your dollars to run this organization. We are not a government entity. <laughs> the state does not fund us. Um, and that's a good thing because we are nonpartisan and look to be, have an independent uh, opinion here on what's happening with how the state raises and spends its dollars. So I hope you'll take some time to dig in your pockets and look under your couch cushions and send us a few dollars to help support our work. And you can really count us to pick, pick up the baton after the election. So this fall will be the time when our state agencies are putting their budgets together to send to the governor. You know, the budget is a bill, but it's also a reflection of our values in the state. And our values at GBPI is that we have an inclusive and participatory budget and budget process that really allows for all Georgians to thrive. So we'll pick up that baton once the, once the election is over, once we know who's sitting in which seat um, and start working with those elected officials to help move the policies forward that we believe will help all Georgians. You'll hear more from us this fall about policy priorities. And then the next big time we'll all be back together is in January. You know that um, just about five days after session starts, the governor drops the amended budget and then the next year's fiscal budget. Um, and we spend a lot of hours breaking down that budget, and you can expect to hear from us at our annual Insights Conference in January. So expect to see a save to the date about that and more to come soon. Um, but thank you all for your time today and count on us to continue to liberate data to move us to a more prosperous Georgia and hope everybody has a great evening. Thank you.